Hey, welcome in. My name is Rick Turner. I'm the head coach of the Jamaica national basketball team. This is the Jamaica basketball project and uh, appreciate everyone jumping on here on the live stream today. Have a, a really special guest who I'll introduce here in a moment. Um, but also want to thank everyone that watches on the replay and, and uh, over the course of, uh, of days here on uh, Facebook live and YouTube live and just appreciate the support. We're doing this just to create awareness about the Jamaica basketball program and, and uh, also give ourselves something to do while this, uh, this lockdown situation is going on and, and uh, it, it fills some, fills some time for us and, and let's, let's just get the word out there. And, and, um, and so thanks again for, for tuning in. Uh, as I mentioned, I have a, a really special guest on here today, someone who um, is uh, knowledgeable, experienced, uh, as dialed in as they come in the, in the sport of basketball. And usually, Jay Billis, when they say those things about you, it means you're old. That's exactly what it means. <laughs> yeah. How are you doing, Rick? Yeah, good, man. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate it. And, and I, gotta, uh, I owe you not only thanks for doing it, but also an apology. We were going to do this last night, and then it occurred to me that everyone has been waiting around for some, 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 some new content and the last dance came out last night, and uh, I would imagine you were among the millions of people that were in front of ESPN watching that last night. Yeah, my whole family. Uh, it was really good. Really enjoyed it. And uh, after the after the broadcast was over, I actually texted Steve Kerr to say, "I don't know whether you looked fifty when you were twenty five or you look twenty five <laughs> now now that you're in your fifties because uh, he looks exactly the same. It's amazing." Yeah. Yeah, it's great. And, then, and it's something to look forward to now. we got two episodes coming up next Sunday. But I can't let it go without – I mean, you played against the men. Mid-'80s, a lot of our Jamaican followers, you know, may not know your background. Of course, uh, uh, so many of the uh, American followers that we have do. But if you're in Jamaica and you, and you only know Jay Billis from ESPN and, and college basketball – he played for the Duke Blue Devils in the in the mid '80s, and and uh, Michael Jordan was the guy that he played against. And uh, just give me some of your thoughts about playing against uh, MJ's Carolina teams and and what that was like back then. I think you guys only got one win against them, if I'm not mistaken. That was in the '80s. Yeah, Jordan was there. Yeah, we we got we got plenty of more after he left. But when he was yeah. he was there two years uh, of the four that I played in college. But the first time I saw him was, you know, I grew up in California in Los Angeles. And the first time I saw Jordan was at a pickup game in Chapel Hill when I was a freshman. My fellow freshman and I, we went over to Chapel Hill to play pickup with him yeah. and uh, with the Carolina guys. And it was, it was the first time, I think, that I, as a basketball player, saw what relentless really looked like. You know, you'd heard the term, but you hadn't really seen it on the floor. You know, guys might play incredibly hard for a period of time, but... He was the first one that that played really hard and, and was incredibly athletic, that played so hard. He was the best player on the floor, but he played the hardest as well. Yeah. Just I before we move on, I gotta make sure I this is correct here. This is you dunking on Michael Jordan, isn't it? Right here. Do you see this? And no, Sam I don't know if I was dunking it. Uh, I tell everybody yes. that I was well, on the way down. I was on the way down. I'll just say I did. Yeah, who can refute yeah, it? There, there'd course. probably be no video evidence that that actually happened. <laughs> um, hey, I, I, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is we're in a situation with Jamaica basketball, a unique one, where there's there's three guys that are draft eligible guys this year who uh, declared their intent to um, try to make it in the NBA, and. Um, Nick Richards at Kentucky, Kofi Coburn at Illinois, and Romaro Gill at, at Seton Hall. And I wanted to get your thoughts on these guys. You do a, spend a lot of time watching a lot of basketball, and um, you know, just kind of wanted to, to get your thoughts of, of what you think of. Let's just start with Nick over at Kentucky, who's probably the highest rated of the three. Yeah, Nick, Nick Richards. It, first, it, you're not going to find a better young man than Nick. He's just such a such a sweet young man. And he's done, a, I think, a really good job of developing over the course of his career at, at Kentucky. He's had, I would say, the normal progression for a really good player, at least the traditional one. We expect so much out of these players now at a younger age. 
But uh, I think Nick has really learned how to uh, impact the game at both ends of the floor at, at a very high level now that, that he's finished his junior year. Uh, he's very athletic, runs the court very well, uh, and can protect the rim. Uh, he can block and change shots, and then he's become a much more productive rebounder. Uh, did a really good job, I thought, of, of running the floor and rim running, uh, and he's a, he's a good offensive rebounder as well. Uh, but his, his offensive game has has matured enough to where he can he, he can make a post move and uh, and he does a very good job of uh, of finishing around the basket and he's he's playing much stronger and making quicker more decisive moves so I've really been impressed with uh, with Nick and the way he's come along I think he's going to be a good NBA player yeah and you know the cool thing about about is is you touched on at the beginning of that is he wasn't so prideful coming into Kentucky, where if you're not a one and done guy, you're a failure. Um, and he wasn't so prideful that he, he couldn't come back for a summer year and then again for a junior year. And you see what it, what it has done for him. If he would have, I think, let ego get in the way and, and, and just come out, you know, who knows where he'd be right now, not in the NBA, you know, that's a really good point. Yeah. He, he's, yeah. He, that's why I said sort of the, he's had the normal progression in an old school way for a really good player. You know, you come in, you, you know, you learn, you get a little bit better year by year. And then he, he sort of broke out this year and became the player we, we all expected him to be. You ever talk to coach Cal about him in particular? Or? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, sort of that, the, just that idea that, I mean, it's been a little bit, you know, it's not been a struggle, it's been, it's been a progression for, for him yeah. I think because he was so talented and McDonald's all American and he was expected by a lot of people to only be there for a year, but it didn't work out for him. He just wasn't consistent. You know, he might have one game where he had, uh, I remember his freshman year, he had one game where he had nine rebounds, but he yeah. followed that up where he didn't have, he didn't have 20 rebounds in his next six games and uh, uh, combined. So it, it was just a question of, of him learning how to impact the game consistently. Um, and, and I think he really built toward that. He broke out this year and really, really became that player that we expected him to be. Yeah. Another guy, Kofi Coburn over at Illinois. Yeah, Kofi, Co the year of the Big Ten. Yeah, um, Kofi Coburn was really a, a revelation to me. I didn't see him play in high school which is a little bit unusual for, for top players that I would usually see him, but I didn't see him. And uh, I mean, you, you know, Rick, his body is, he looks like an NFL player and he's got good hands. And, uh, and I thought he really, his skill level just really started to shoot through the roof where he was getting, not only getting better, but getting more and more confident uh, mm -hmm. as he went along. And man, he, there, there was, there was nobody in that league that was as physically imposing and could back it up as, as well as he could. Uh, I was really impressed. I think, you know, now what do I think he would be better off if he, uh, stayed in college and became a more dominant player rather than going to the NBA and be a, be a role player, mm -hmm. uh, right away. Um, I, I think that might be better for him, but reasonable minds can differ on that. But but I yeah. think he's going to make somebody a very, very good uh, addition because of, of his size and his ability to move his feet uh, and his his, uh, his skill level, which is rapidly improving. Give us some insight of what a young man like Kofi goes through. You know, ha having the, the, the really solid freshman year, I'm sure there's people in his ear, all the – all the mock drafts that I see don't have him anywhere in the first or second round. I don't know whether and you know how you believe that. What where are they getting advice? I'm sure it's not just it, it, there's not a cookie cutter approach, but but he must think he has a chance to to make an NBA roster if he's gonna if he's gonna leave early. That's a good question. I don't think it all, Rick, comes down to just somebody getting in their ear and giving them, you know, what some may consider or we may consider less than good advice. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a function of these players are are growing up in an era where they look to one side or the other and they see a peer of theirs that's going into the NBA and being successful. And I think just just as we might. When, when we would look at a player that was maybe McDonald's All-American, you thought, you know, like you thought you were as good as that player. 
Yeah, you yeah. say, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go do this too, or I'm gonna I'm just as good. Um, that's part of it, I think. Just that that natural uh, response. The other part, um, I think, has to do with uh, with players that are just ready to make the commitment to be pros, and they're willing. You know, they they think highly of themselves, but they're willing willing to play in the G League for a while yeah. and and try to build their way up. So I'm not sure that it's necessarily like. You know, somebody's telling a kid, "Hey, you're going to be a first round pick, or you have a promise," uh, mm-hmm. and lying to them. I think it's it's the players now thinking, "Hey, you know, I've seen a lot of guys go from the G League to being a, an NBA All Star. They've seen it happen, or yeah. at least they believe that can happen for them." So I think that's a, it's a combination of things. Yeah, confidence in themselves, and then and also the the just the knowing that that the G League isn't a isn't a bad path for them. And, and, and the, because they're seeing guys in the G league every year that are going back and forth. And, and so you don't have to be a first or second round pick in order to, to have your dream come true. If you're one of these guys, Romaro Gill from Seton hall, most improved player in the big East, all defensive player, shot blocker, um, you know, made a lot of strides uh, from last year to this. Did you get a chance to see Seton hall play much? And, and what do you think of Mr. Gill? I, I saw Seton Hall play a lot, and I thought that that Romero was a, a huge part of their success. His defense is is far ahead of his offense as a player right now, but because of his size and his ability to protect the rim, uh, and he he does he does a pretty good job of setting screens and playing off those, rolling to the hard to the basket. Um, so I think he can be a good screen role player. He's not a, he's not necessarily a pick and pop shooter or anything like that. He doesn't do that, but, mm-hmm. uh, but he's got value. And I think all three of the players we've talked about, Nick, Kofi, uh, Romero, they, they all have value at the next level, but it, it's a little bit, as you know, better than I do, Rick, it, it, things have changed even in the last 10 years where, uh, yeah. 10, 15 years ago, the three players we're talking about, their size would be of tremendous value in the league. Right um, Now, a lot of it comes down to can you shoot the ball and can you stretch the floor and can you be a versatile you know, player that we play five out and you know, uh, positionless basketball type stuff. But mm-hmm. the NBA is still looking for legitimate rim protectors and size and guys that can rim run. But if you can block shots and protect the rim, and if you can play screen roll basketball, you've got an opportunity, I think, to, to make a good living in the league. Yeah. And it's too bad because Seton Hall really had a chance to make a run this year. I agree. Yeah. That, that's one of the many things from the pandemic that uh, that has been, you know, obviously there are bigger issues. But if we're just talking mm-hmm. solely about the basketball part of it, uh, that, that was most disappointing is, to, is a team like Seton Hall this was as good a chance as they've had since maybe in the last 20 years to, uh, to reach a final four and maybe win one. And, uh, and it's very disappointing for them not to be able to, to realize that. Yeah. You know, obviously, you know, a focus of, of what we're doing here is trying to create awareness for Jamaica basketball. And, 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 you know, our goal is the 2024 Olympics in Paris. And, you know, when I try, when I talk to guests, so I have on here the ones that have played for national programs, whether it be Jamaica or wherever, it's a special deal. And you're one of those guys that have, that have put on the USA basketball uniform. Tell me about that. Tell me what, what that's like, because you, you played for the, for, the, for the top college basketball program in the country, but there's something different about putting on a, a, a uniform that says USA across the chest or, or Jamaica across the chest. Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, it's a it's an indescribable uh, feeling of of pride and honor and and duty as well. Uh, mm-hmm. I think when whenever you can play for your country, uh, there's a there's a, a a responsibility that goes with that 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 you feel a certain amount of awe, frankly. And yeah. okay, it doesn't compare to to wearing a a, a, the, a service uniform you know, to being in the military or making that sort of sacrifice. It's not that kind of feeling, but, um, or that kind of commitment, I should say, mm-hmm. but, but there's an element of that kind of feeling. Uh, and, and, and largely because of all those people that have worn the uniform of the, of the service servicemen or women, um, it, 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 it just has a special level of pride that you can't, you can't reach any other way. I don't think. 
Right. Here's your squad back back in the day there. Yeah, look at that hair. We all had hair back then. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. What do you remember about that, about playing in that tournament? Well, mostly you know that? Taiwan. I'm sorry. Taiwan is that where that was? Or yeah, Philippines? it was in Taipei, Taiwan. It's called the Jones Cup. Uh, yeah. We played it in 1985, and you know, played with some great guys. Um, you know, Harold Presley played at Villanova, and Tommy Amaker was one of my uh, you know my teammates, and and at Duke, and one of the you know truly great players, and Troy Lewis and Todd Mitchell at, at Purdue, and Joe Wolf at North Carolina. We had we had a group of really good players. We were very fortunate. Yeah, that's fun. Um, as far as the draft goes this year, up up in the air. What are your what are your thoughts about you know the, the top guys coming out and and who to look for or any any sleepers that um, you know maybe we haven't heard about but but you saw because of your travels in in college basketball this year? Yeah, I think it'll be interesting, Rick, because I don't think it's the deepest or the best draft that I've been uh, that I've covered. I've been mm -hmm. on the draft desk for ESPN since two thousand three when actually LeBron James was drafted. Yeah, uh, it was LeBron and Darko Milicic and uh, Carmelo Anthony, Chris Bosh, that old group. Um, so it's not that kind of class like we had in 2003. And it, it, it's yeah. among the weaker drafts that I've I've uh, covered for ESPN. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't going to be some really good players in it that come out of it. Um, mm -hmm. But Anthony Edwards of uh, of Georgia and uh, and James Wiseman of uh, the, who went to Memphis for a short period of time. Those are the two players I think that. Um, will vie for the number one spot um, mm -hmm. this year. Um, there, are, you know, there are a few players. You know, Lamelo Ball of uh, yeah. who played overseas. Lonzo Ball's younger brother is maybe the most talented player in the draft, and he is very, very talented. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, you know, we don't even know one who's going to remain in the draft because it's another right. year where there's been a ton of players that have declared. And they declared with really without the ability of being able to uh, go to a combine. They're, the combine is usually in May. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to have a combine. Right. Um, and, and so that's a different thing. And then because of the pandemic and the quarantine, you really can't go work out for NBA teams. So for players to get feedback, I'm not sure whether that's going to cause more players to pull out of the draft or if it's going to cause more players to stay in. Yeah, um, I've not gotten a feel for that yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, the draft is scheduled for the you know third Thursday, I think, is like the twenty third of June. Uh, I don't even know whether it's going to go off as right. scheduled. You know whether they're going to keep it where it is or if it goes into because they have to establish a draft order. And exactly. if, if the NBA doesn't finish the season, they can go off of this draft order and then have a lottery to determine you know the the first you know first few slots. But uh, or the first whatever the slots are up to thirteen or fourteen whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it that's a that's going to be a, a difficult thing to figure out in the short run. So yeah. uh, I don't even know when the draft's going to be. That's got to be unsettling for all the players. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Before I let you go, just a couple more questions sure. about kind of about the draft and, and that. You know, you talked about Lamelo Ball, um, R.J. Hampton from New Zealand skipped college. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of guys uh, this year, Jalen Green, Isaiah Todd, doing the same thing, going right to the G League. What's, what do you think that impact is going to be for college basketball? I kind of think it might have a positive impact ultimately. I just I want to get your thoughts as, as more and more guys decide that they're just going to directly turn pro and, and bypass college altogether. Yeah, I don't see it having a positive impact. I don't think it's going to, you know, look, it's not going to kill college basketball or anything or, or, you know, decimate it or hurt it, all these doomsday predictions, yeah. but it's really not going to help it. I just don't see a scenario where not having the best players makes college basketball better. Um, I don't buy that. And if, and if people are saying if there's some sort of thought that, well, that will allow uh, everyone to focus on the, the four-year player, the, the player that sticks around for a longer period of time. Well, nothing's stopping uh, uh, you know, fans from focusing on those players now. They're not doing it. Mm -hmm. They're focused on the most talented players, and the most talented players are leaving the game early, whether it's, whether it's not at all after one year uh, or after two. Mm -hmm. you know, we've seen a, an extraordinary amount of players over the years leaving early. And that hurts the game. There's just no question about that. Yeah. Um, 
the the but my thing with college with the college space and the NCAA is you know it's not just a function of we're losing all the talent the function the, the question is what's the best thing for young players mm -hmm. and a lot of us think the best thing is for them to go to school for a, a period of time whether it's one year two years whatever it is i can't believe zion williamson didn't benefit from being a duke for a year duke mm -hmm. certainly benefited but i think zion did too so yeah. we need to, we need to be more uh, more open to allowing players to accomplish more while they're while they're in school earn money do all these different things do commercials you know their name image and likeness so that we provide incentives for them to stay in school, not not barriers. Yeah. Is there a special talent involved in coaching one and done guys? How come some programs are more successful with them than others? And I, and I specifically, I think about where I am in Seattle, about University of Washington, who's had a run of over the last 10 years, one and done guys that haven't even made the NCAA tournament. Whereas, you know, the, the blue ones, if you will, are getting those guys and, and having success. Is there, is there a special talent to coaching those guys or what's your, what's your thought there? That's a good question. I think it has to do with how many of them you have. <laughs> right. So if you have, if you have a, a player that is only there for a, a year and you only have one, maybe two of them, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's extraordinary to have two. Mm -hmm. um, you'd better have a lot around them. Uh, because no two players are going to win, no matter whether they're seniors or, or freshmen. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you see teams like Duke and Kentucky do a little bit better, it's because they got five or six of them, yeah. and uh, and then they have a few older players. So everybody's got older players. Yeah. Um, so I think I, I think it's more a function of that. I mean, you saw it, you've seen it at, at, at LSU when Ben Simmons was only there for a year, uh, and uh, same thing this year at Georgia with Anthony Edwards. So those are programs that didn't make the NCAA tournament. So one player is usually not enough to to turn a program and all that. Uh, you'd better have you'd better have a bunch of, of really good players because that's what it takes to win uh, on any level. But I don't I don't put it on coaches. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to to coach any any freshman, let alone a player that you you know you're not going to have for the next year. That's a that's a different dynamic. But it's not it's not driven by the coaches. They they just have to deal with what they have. Yeah. Um, for the last, what, maybe eight years or so, I want to say 2013, you've been doing your own camp in North Carolina. An elite, yeah. elite basketball um, camp that got canceled this year. Yeah, we just pulled the, had to pull a plug on it a couple weeks ago just because of facilities and the like. But it's been a really rewarding experience, not just to, uh, to work with the players. We have about 120 players that come in from all over the country, high school age players. But we've had a, a coaches development program and then a coaches leadership program that have, have been very, um, not a, hopefully successful, but but uh, uplifting for all of us, I think. And uh, just renewing our commitment uh, over what this is all about. And it's really about, you know, the, the coach player relationship. Uh, so we, we've spent a lot of time on that uh, in the last seven, eight years trying to build it up. And, you know, it's unfortunate this this summer, but we'll uh, we'll get back to business next year, we hope, and uh, and and try to move forward in a positive way. So I get a hard time from my friends once in a while when I bring up the fact that uh, I wrote a book. Um, you did the same, but your book is a lot cooler than my book. My book is called "If My Name Was Phil Jackson, Would You Read This?" <laughs> your, your book is called "Toughness," and and the reason I wanted to bring it up and. And I know, I know you wrote it a few years ago, but you can still get it on Amazon. And um, one of the things that comes up a lot when I'm talking to Jamaican coaches is they keep saying our kids just aren't tough enough. You know, they just they don't know what it's like to work hard. And you dedicated an entire book to that topic and just wondered if I could just get your thoughts about about players nowadays and the toughness it takes to to be a winner yeah it's a good question i mean I, I don't i don't think players nowadays are are that much different than they used to be i don't either um I, and and i can't speak to what what players are like generally or specifically in jamaica but the players i come into contact with uh spend more time playing and work harder than we ever did yeah. um you know i i i 
coach my son's AEU team for a couple of summers and we had some really good players and, and it was a really enjoyable experience. But, you know, every once in a while, you know, players would play three games in a day and yeah. uh, maybe didn't play well in one of the games or wasn't sharp as you would, you would hope or they would hope. And afterwards, some of the parents w- would say, well, we gotta, we gotta, these kids don't know how to work hard. They don't know how to play hard, compete. And I said, you know what we need to do? We we need to take all of our old film and show it, show them how we never took a playoff and we always played well in our third game of the day. Right. And I'm just sometimes I wonder if our expectations are a little out of whack. Um, you know, the, the the main thing to me is, especially with younger younger players, and I'm not talking about on the national team level where it's where it's that sort of elite level, mm-hmm. but for younger players, um, it's supposed to be it's supposed to be a fun experience. And if if practice isn't fun for the coaches, it's probably not going to be fun for the players. Mm-hmm. So how can we get our work done and uh, and you know sort of accomplish what we want to while at the same time making it competitive and fun? It doesn't mean everybody has to be having laughs all the time. Yeah. But, but being creative enough to where it's something they want to do. And you know the the to me you know the the times I worked the hardest I wasn't thinking about the work I was doing I was I was playing because I I loved it and I loved being out there, right. and and I loved the sort of the competition of it and I was willing to do what it took to compete, mm-hmm. um, and I think that that was true of the guys I played with but I I, I give credit to the coaches that we had, um, and so that that's really what what our role is you know as we're older in the game now is creating an environment where the players can go out and and perform and achieve and and all that um you know it's not all a reflection of what you know what we're doing you know sort of as the adults in the room or the the coaches and administrators um you know we've got to provide the players the 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 platform and the best opportunity to perform otherwise what are we doing you know i don't there's sometimes where i i want to say i don't get it on the lower levels because I'll go and watch and, and the coaches are, are just at times unreasonable right. and, and with the way they handle themselves, the way they handle their players. And uh, it's not every, it's not everywhere. It's not all of them. Of course, it's just a smaller percentage. Most, most of the coaches I, I deal with get it, but, uh, but generally I don't find the complaints um, uh, about players not being tough or players not working hard I don't find that an indictment on the players. I find it sort of a, a an admission by the coaches, if you will. Yeah. You know, uh, I feel like AU, I don't know if you feel the same way. AU is its own culture, you know, in terms of, of basketball. And and I think we allow things to happen there that, that we normally wouldn't, but, but that's the way it is. If this thing goes on longer than anyone expects, and it wipes out the summer. What does recruiting look like for college coaches going into, into next year? And it probably doesn't affect the top 50 or 100 players, but, but will it bring high school basketball back into play a little bit more and give it a little bit more emphasis than, than the AAU or, or no? If that's all we have, it will. Um, you know, if we go through a summer and we don't have any AAU or – uh, you know, sort of the normal camps that we would have. W- w- will that, if the first time you can really see a player is, you know, next next winter, um, it may for a short period of time. But things, will, you know, when things normalize, we'll go back to the the way we have been doing it. And you know, I think your point about the AU being its own culture, and, and I, you're not just talking about the AU. It's summer basketball. We're just using that as a uh, shorthand, but. Um, sort of the summer basketball culture. I mean, it is what we've made of it. And the reason, like, like my kid went through it. Did I have some questions about it? Yes. Um, It it was, to me, it was kind of a waste of time to spend that much time traveling around to to play ball when, you know, half the teams we played were from our general area anyway. We go to Orlando. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. We go to Florida or Texas to play basketball, we wanted to play in some of the teams that, that, that we already knew and, and played against already in our area. So, you know, you're kind of going, well, what, what's the point of this? Um, you feel forced as a parent, you feel forced to do it though. You can, but nobody's, you're not forced at all. Like what happens no, if, if your yeah. kid didn't go, if the kid can play, 
you know, nobody's going to care where the kid plays. And, you know, look, I'll, I'll be very interested in how, in what coaches find to complain about after this is over. Because they'll say, well, they shouldn't be playing AAU ball. They should be in their backyard doing ball handling drills. Well, now that's all they're doing. Mm-hmm. And I promise you, when we get back, they'll say, well, nobody's been playing. Yeah. You know, what, are you, what are you doing? Are you doing ball handling? Are you doing, are you doing ball handling drills? Or what are you doing to pass the time? I did. You know, I did. I'll, t- I'll tell you this. I did. All the years I, I've been around basketball, I never really took the time to learn how to spin a ball on my finger. I can do a little bit, but you know, some, some of my friends can spin spin a ball on all five fingers and all that stuff. I've never never been able to do that. So I was yeah. thinking I probably ought to take some time while I'm just sitting around to learn how to do that. Yeah. But I haven't done that yet. Maybe I will. Um, I'm doing the same thing everybody else is. I, I, I get up in the morning. I try to get a workout in uh, on this Peloton bike. So I'm probably going to be in the Olympics, you know, uh, riding. Mm-hmm pulling a Greg LeMond or being Tour de France. Perfect. And uh, and I'm I'm catching up on some uh, some old TV shows that I haven't watched and uh, just trying to trying to get as much family time as I can. Uh, that's been the only, if you want to call it silver lining in a horrible situation, uh, that's the only silver lining is the, the amount of family time. For sure. I'm going to let you go on one last question. We have a, a, a viewer that watches pretty consistently who's an Illinois fan. And uh, she lives in Champaign or just right outside Champaign, season ticket holder for Illinois. Her favorite player is Frank Williams. And um, I know she's, I don't think she's watching now, but she will be watching later. And she asked me to ask you a question. She wanted to know your memories of the 05 Illinois run, specifically the comeback they had against Arizona and then losing, finally losing in the finals. Does, Does that, any of that ring a bell to you? Oh yeah! Oh, I was a big, uh, big believer in that team. Um, I, I, I did a game early on uh, at Assembly Hall where they beat the tar out of uh, out of Wake Forest. Wake Forest, I think, was number one, and Illinois was might have been two or three, and yeah. and they were up thirty at one point in that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just a great, great team uh, with you know D Brown, Darren Williams, Roger Powell, that whole that whole group, uh, and. I wound up doing their Elite Eight game uh, against Arizona in the Rosemont Horizon in Chicago. And oh, uh, it was a fantastic basketball team that could have easily won a national championship. They, they were they were really, really fun to be around, fun to watch. Yeah, cool. All right, Teresa, we got it in for you. Appreciate it. Jay, thanks so much for doing this. I, I really oh, thanks, appreciate Ray. it. And uh, keep your eye on our Jamaicans and and uh, root for us as we make a push for Paris in in, in 2024 and and um i just again thanks for doing it no thanks for having me and good good luck to you guys yeah thanks